Hi, I'm Gina, mum to James. James has a lot of complex health needs. He's a full-time wheelchair user. He cannot talk in the conventional sense, but is an emerging eye gaze user. His biggest nemesis is epilepsy. I remember his little hand grasping my thumb as a baby during ghastly seizures. The heart would break a little more with every one. I never could have known I would still be holding his hand as a 23-year-old man during nasty seizures. Seeing that look of terror and distortion on his handsome face, feeling more heartbreak. My heart over the years must have broke millions of times, but fortunately, love puts those pieces back together. Age 23 now, we were told he would not reach 10. I will give you a bit of our backstory. For us, the journey started when James was two months old. His little arm shot up like he was, having, like he was startled at first. I did not know this was a seizure, but then when he started doing it soon after when awake, with his eyes blown up, we called an ambulance. Our first of many over the years. I was, it was not a quicker process to get a diagnosis, as I'm sure many of you can relate. At first it was having blood tests, lumbar punches, scans, ECGs, EEGs and so on. But trying to catch one of those seizures on all of those tests was proven impossible. I remember at one point saying, someone's got to do something, a phrase I've repeated many more times again over the years. And I remember a nurse saying, what's the matter with you, he's only having little seizures. I'm wondering what she would think now if she was to meet him again. He finally got the diagnosis of lennox gastaut syndrome at age 15. In actual fact, a diagnosis I asked if he had at age 3, but was told no, it isn't that. LGS is a particularly nasty form of epilepsy that brings multiple seizure types, developmental problems, and in most cases it seems to be drug resistant. In those early years he was having hundreds of seizures every day and having rescue meds up to three times a day. I remember arguing with, arguing with a GP's receptionist who said we didn't need more rectal diazepam as it's for emergencies only and saying you should not need that many and at that point thinking what do you think we are doing with it? You know, we, we're fighting for him to live but the odds are against us if we can't even get the right meds. Life is hard if your young person, your young person has epilepsy. You are constantly on high alert and I think when you do sleep it's always with one eye open and both ears still listening waiting for the next seizure to strike, watching and holding your breath as long as they do, hoping that it soon will stop, or preparing to give rescue meds or call an ambulance. This cannot be good for our mental health. The stress is extreme, and even though you learn to live with it, I don't think it gets any easier to see your child go through this. You have to also think about siblings and what effect it has on them. Our daughter Natasha is three years older than James, and it is hard. She has gone through the trauma of witnessing this as well. When she was four or five, she had a doll and she was shaking it. And I said, what are you doing? And she replied, it's having fits like what babies do. It's a term we used back then. She thought it was what babies do and it was normal for babies to have seizures. She, ha she has witnessed them in the resuscitation room. All things that she now realises are not normal being a mother herself. But it still haunts her. Some of the things she witnessed, so I'm not saying we had stuff from our other children. But what I am saying is you need to take time to check in with them, talk to their schools, make them aware of the situation at home. So if they are tired after a late night ambulance call, or they were disturbed by the seizure alarms, the teachers understand, or even upset, because they get scared too. Over the years, James has been on many, many drug cocktails, ketogenic diet, had the vagal nerve stimulator implant. In actual fact, he has just had his fourth fit this summer, and he's had four in eight years. Each one's supposed to last in between five and seven years. He wears them out pretty fast, but they do reduce the amount and severity. I explain how it works to people but saying that it, by saying that it floods the brain with good electrical activity, neutralising the bad electrical activity. It's a bit like a circuit break breaker. I know there are more technical explanations out there, but explaining it like this works for me. We keep having them replaced, although the surgeon told me it gets more tricky the more times it's done. So this has worried me a bit about the future and after years of trying to get cannabis we finally got it 18 months ago on the NHS and that, with that and the vagal nerve stimulator these have made a huge difference not only in seizures but he is more of a light too. With epilepsy it can be affected by so many things too. With James, if overtired, has more. If understimulated, can have more. If he gets ill with a bugger virus, again more seizures and recently we nearly lost James and it turned out the massive amount of constant seizures for a week was due to a bowel impaction. There were no signs of constipation, he pooed regularly, no stiff tummy. He just stopped eating for three weeks, leading up to the hospital admission. Of course, 
With the bowel impaction, meds are not absorbed properly and become ineffective. There are so many triggers, even sage causes James to seize. If I'm honest, life is a bit of a minefield with epilepsy. I feel the professionals, although sometimes empathetic, they do not understand totally unless they live in the same type of life we do. They don't understand when you turn up irritable to an appointment that you have been up half the night, seeing to seizures, changing beds when become soiled, then getting your child up, showered, dressed and out the door in plenty of time to reach the hospital on the other side of town, or indeed out of town, and that you've pulled over in the car with your hazard lights on, on the way to see to your child in the back of your car or van, having a seizure. Then when finally arrived at the hospital, you spent half an hour trying to find somewhere to park. They don't see this. They see you and just think you are an angry, moody person. They don't see what it takes just to reach a 10-minute appointment. And that is, that is before they talk to you about your child, sometimes delivering bad news. Seriously, how much do we have on our shoulders? Over the years, I have learned to do things differently and here are a few of my top dip tips. My first one is, do not ever talk about death or prognosis with your child or young person present or what will happen to them should something happen to you. You never know what your child can understand and this could cause extreme anxiety to them. So if at a doctor's appointment, if possible, take someone with you or ask an assistant to take them out. Do not be afraid to stop a professional in their tracks. A few months ago, I went to a neurosurgeon appointment and he started talking about risks and how if things went wrong, what would he would have to do. I jumped up and covered James's ears and said, you don't need to listen to this, do you, James? My next tip is acceptance. Realising that at some point your child may never be seizure free and striking that balance of medication and quality of life. Do you want your child so medicated they indeed have no quality of life? Or is it time to get the best cover you can and let them enjoy the alertness less drugs bring? But never stop looking, as there are new things and there are people working on epilepsy all of the time. My next one is understanding your child's seizures. Learn about the types early on. In our journey, the internet was not as it is now. James was born in 1998, so I didn't have that huge knowledge that is out there now all the support from others on similar journeys. Join good Facebook support groups. Join parent care forums. Somewhere you can ask questions and get ideas. Video those seizures on your smartphone to keep a log to see if patterns are emerging so you can tweak timings of meds. Show these to professionals, let them see what is going on. This could be to a teacher that doesn't understand why they are sleepy, a physiotherapist who cannot get what they want out of a session, or even a family member that just does not understand. Doctors still ask me now what he does in a seizure when I say he's having tonic clonics. I think by now I know the seizure types. We actually have a tablet that we use for seizure diaries. On there we have record, record videos to use for doctors and any new staff that work with James as well as the epilepsy management plan. We upload on there things like moving and handling or how to shower etc. As well as lots of invaluable, invaluable information in one place. My next tip is get a good monitor that picks up your child's seizures. We have tried many over the years, but at present, having a pulse guard, we have a pulse guard and are just in the process of getting CCTV fitted into his room, as the cheap ones bought don't last. So wherever we are, we can now see he's safe. If you are eligible for funding for a carer to work a working night, we at the moment have funding through a personal health budget for two nights a week, but I have asked for five, as I am so tired. I guess it is about asking them how many nights they sleep. A good friend pointed this out to me a while back. Emergency bag, that's my next tip. If you have a frequent hospital emergency, have a bag packed ready with PJs for the young person. Pads, wipes, whatever they need for an overnight stay. But put in clean underwear for you, for yourself and a small toiletry bag, phone charger or charge power bank and maybe some non-perishable snacks. I have a bag near his medicine cabinet that I throw his medicine to, if time. The amount of time I've spent in A&E and I couldn't count my, I couldn't count. My most recent visit, I was in A&E 24 hours as there were no neuro beds. And as my presentation is called Seizure Day, let them live their lives, help them have fun every day in between seizures, make each moment memorable. Admittedly, this can be tiring. Ask for help, ask for funding if eligible, to enable carers, personal assistants to take over some of the mundane duties. So your, your young person is getting the best version of you, less tired, less stressed. Getting help does not make you a failure, it makes you stronger and more able. Thanks for listening. If you are a parent carer, I'm sure I haven't told you anything you don't already know. But if you are someone that works with families, I hope it has given you an insight into how life is living with epilepsy.